And sometimes in the Bible, we jump into the middle of one of Jesus' thoughts without hearing what he said first that brought up to it, and then what he says afterwards, but it's all based on this key thought. And this is the key thought that we find in Luke chapter 18, verse number 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Anybody have a nickname for somebody? Yeah. Anybody? Let, let's, let's go to some of our newlyweds. Katie, when you really want BJ to know that you're not happy with him, wait a second, that's probably never happened. And so let's, let's go to something else. Let, let's say when you, when you want him to know that you are very, very, very happy that God put you two together, do you have a name or do you just say, hey, BJ? Middle name. Middle name. And his middle name is? James. And so you say, James. Benjamin James. You know, when my mom used my middle name, I was in trouble. <laughs> and so uh, I'm so glad you're breaking the curve. So very nice. Now, you probably heard me say that my one of my favorite phrases for my wife is fish lips. And so... Uh, I remember the remember the vow. You ask her. <laughs> now, Phil, I know you. You leave here and run straight out to that other room and tell her everything I said. That's okay, Phil. Go ahead. And, and so, uh, uh, how many of you have got a phrase for someone that you call them, and when, when you hear them say that, it just makes your heart flutter? Anybody? Did you know that sometimes people have phrases for themselves? Anybody remember Muhammad Ali? I am the greatest. I am the champion. I am beautiful. Anybody remember? Yeah. And when he said it, was he bragging? No. <laughs> Compared to how many fights he had been to not have a cut on his face, it's miraculous. He was maybe pound for pound the best fighter who ever lived. Wow. And so when he would say those things, he wouldn't say his name. He would say, I am. And Jesus had a phrase, I am. And Jesus' favorite phrase for himself is, I am the Son of Man. I am the Son of Man. Now, we're going to talk about that phrase a little bit today. But he says, when the Son of Man comes, who is he talking about when he says here in Luke chapter 18, verse 8? How many of you have a red letter version of the Bible? So, what color are those letters? Red. So, who's saying it? Jesus. Jesus is talking about himself when he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith on the earth? Now, the question is, why would he say when he comes if he's already there? It's going to be a two-phase project. When he originally came in the human flesh, and when he comes again in the consummation of the ages. The first question was, did Israel fulfill her job? What was the job of national Israel? To be the light to the Gentiles. To tell the world the Messiah is coming. And what has been passed on to the church? To tell the world what? And he's coming again. Don't be surprised. Now hear me, coming again is a two-phase process. It could either be when Jesus comes back again and physically puts his feet back on this rock. He's going to do that. Don't be taken by surprise. He, that is a done deal. It's for sure. And hear me, the other done deal is even if he doesn't come in your lifetime, you're going to go to him. Either you're going to go to him and he's going to say, welcome, or he's going to go to him and you're going to say, you rejected my cross, depart from me, I never knew you. But all of you are going to go to him. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, but not everybody gets to go to heaven. Will the Son of Man find faith on the earth? Now, I want you to notice that in the middle of verse number 18 is where there's the transition. It says, in chapter 18, verse number 8, he says, I tell you that justice will come speedily. How many of you think that justice doesn't come fast enough? Yeah. Anybody ever feel that way? Just remember that God doesn't keep time with a Rolex. What can you, let's think about some tough times. Has anybody had tough times sure. that just seem like they last? Yes. Yeah. Now I want you to put that in a composite time continuum compared to eternity. You see, one day you're going to go, how many of us have ever been a freshman in high school? Anybody ever been a freshman in high school? And you go, four more years. <laughs> Anybody ever hear that? Yeah. Four more years, and all of a sudden you wake up and you go, it's over? <laughs> Where did those four, anybody ever feel that way? Where did those four years go? I can remember Margaret and I were praying about whether or not I should finish up my doctorate degree. And they said, it's only another 120 more units of doctorate level of study. Now, how many of us know that a 
BA degree from a college is 120 units. Most master's degree are 35. Mine was 96. My doctorate degree was another 120 above the 96, above the 120. And I thought this, the Lord will come back before I finish this study. <laughs> Pastor Larry is just finishing his doctorate degree. And have you ever, has he ever said, the Lord will probably come back before I defend this paper? Yeah. And you have said it about it as well. Okay. And so here we are, you know. And yet, how many of us have said, all of a sudden we go, where did the time go? Anybody ever feel that way? Where did it go? Where did it go? Um, nevertheless, he says, even though you may not see it as speedily compared to eternity, it's just that fast. We are one heartbeat from eternity. And eternity may be dependent upon how I take care of that next heart. He says, nevertheless, now, how many of you have got to right in the middle of this? I tell you, uh, justice will come to this speedily. Nevertheless, how many of you got the word nevertheless? How many of you got in your Bible the word however? Anybody have however? Some versions of the Bible say, but when, but when, in other words, there's a break in the thought. He says, justice is going to come. Nevertheless now, what I need you to remember is until that day comes, don't be living. How many of us are living for Jesus to come again and living in a time vacuum today? Say, I'm afraid to do this. I'm afraid to do that. I don't want to go here. I don't want to do this. I'm afraid to say that. We're living out of fear of the day because we're thinking down the future, someday God will fix it. You know, we've got to work out our salvation. Now, what does that mean? The Bible says for us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. You know what that means? That means that doesn't mean I can't work on how to get saved, but once I'm saved, I ought to let it work out in my life. In other words, be a part of my life. Why do we lift weights? So we can brag about how much weight we lift? Or is it so I can block better, or tackle better, or throw, or run faster? There is a purpose to my workout. So there is a purpose to my salvation. It is so that I can operate better for Him in the kingdom in which the world in which I live. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes. Now I want you to say, uh, I want you to see that this phrase, the Son of Man for Jesus, occurs 189 times in the Bible. How many of you say, well that's, yeah, I believe that. It does occur 189 times in the Bible. Most of the time, these are the books we find them in. How many of you say, well, no, no, no. It's got to be in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, right? The majority of the times have got to be in the gospel, right? If we take a look at a composite, and this is a hits in the Bible where the Son of Man, this comes out of my Bible software. If you take a look, the prophet Ezekiel calls Jesus the Son of Man more than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John combined. So when Jesus was going around saying, I am the Son of Man, I am the Son of Man, I am the Son of Man, they have been hearing it from their prophets forever. They were not surprised when Jesus called himself the Son of Man. They would have been surprised if he didn't and claimed to be God himself. In fact, you can't be the Son of Man unless you are God, and you can't be God and not be the Son of Man. They're inseparable. And so, should they have been surprised? No, they were not surprised. That's why they wanted to kill him. You see, in, in their day, they had a thing called the Father and the Son's were equal. It just took time for that to happen. So like, let's say Joseph was a carpenter. Let's just pretend like he was a carpenter. And Joseph had a carpenter shop that had a sign that said, Joseph, carpenter. And then he has children. And it says, Joseph and son on the sign. Anybody ever see that happen? And then eventually Joseph dies and it says what? Son. Son or Jesus. And there is a time where the father is the father, and as the son grows up, they become co-adults. Did you know one of the hardest things for moms and dads to do is learn how to treat their children as adults? Now hear me, they never stop being children. They never stop being your children. But you do end up stop being their daddy. What does the Bible say? A man shall leave his who? Father and mother and cleave to who? If, you're, if you are caring more about your mom and dad's opinion to your wife than your opinion to your wife, you're a mama's boy. <laughs> now let me just tell you, you're breaking the Bible. You're going to say, but I love my little baby. Come on, what does the Bible say? A man shall what? 
leave. Now that doesn't mean he says, bye-bye, good riddance, never want to see you again. What does that mean? I live for my family, not just for my mom. Okay, and so we find out that the Son of Man, that Jesus would say, I am the Son of Man. And they should have heard. That's what Ezekiel told us. That's what Daniel told us. That's what Numbers told us. The books of the law, the books of the prophet, the books of poetry, they all told us that when the Messiah comes, that's what he's going to call himself. And when Jesus showed up calling himself the Son of Man, they knew. But they rejected. They didn't reject because they didn't know. They rejected because they got what they didn't want. Anybody ever get something you didn't want, but you knew it was good for you, but you still didn't want it? My, my dad used to say this. We talked about it in Sunday school. My dad used to say this. This is going to hurt you a lot more than it hurts me. Because my dad knew that it wasn't really going to hurt him much at all. So he just flipped the phrase around. Instead of, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, he said, this is going to hurt you much more than it hurts me. Now hear me. When God disciplines, he doesn't discipline because he hates us. He disciplines because he loves us. And he never disciplines us just to pound us into the dirt. He disciplines us so we can be lifted up into his presence. And so how do we become conformed to the image of the Son of Man? We have got to be disciplined by the God of all eternity. The Son of God is a phrase that means deity. And so how many of us know that Jesus is eternally the Son of God? How many of us know that there is God the Father, there is God the Son, and there is God the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit? Now how many of us know that there are three completely different entities that are all completely triune unity? Yes. They are inseparable, but they're individual. They are supremely independent, but absolutely codependent and inseparable from each other. And so when you talk about Jesus being the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, we've also got to say, but at the exact same time, He is completely deity, but He's also Son of Man, which means He's completely humanity. Has anybody ever said, that person doesn't know how it feels to be me? I've had a lot of people say, oh, you know, I, I, can really, I really know what you're going through. And you're thinking, no, you don't. Come on, have you ever felt that way? You know, I've got to be real careful on Mother's Day. Because on Mother's Day, a lot of the women say, you ever have a baby? <laughs> I know you're thinking. Because I've heard you say it. I say, mothers, I just, I just know how you feel. <laughs> yeah, right. And so, well, you know, I don't know how you feel. And to be real honest, I don't want to know how you feel. <laughs> There's a thought of that. I'm glad that God in his sovereignty uh, and so, uh, but Jesus is humanity. Now, hear me. Jesus was not just human. He was the God-man. He was complete deity, and he was complete humanity, all at the same time, and hear me, eternally, all at the same time. Jesus was more human than you are. I want you to think about that phrase just for a minute. He was more human than you, because most of us have been blinded in our humanity by our sin. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve. Anybody remember Adam and Eve in the Bible? And they were in a, living in a place called paradise. Did you know that paradise in Hebrew is, is the word Los No. <laughs> Have seen too much death. 
And we've got to have faith that there is a place called eternal life. They had to have faith where there was a place called physical death. Because they had never seen anything. And because we're broken, sinful people, we've also got a broken understanding. Have you ever tried to understand something and you just couldn't get it? I mean, you just couldn't get it. You just couldn't get it. You know, my wife is trying to tell me the Cowboys are going to the Super Bowl. I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't see it. I don't believe it. And so sometimes we just don't get it. And she would say, your problem is your sinfulness. If you were more in love with Jesus, you'd know the Cowboys are going to the Super Bowl. Jesus was sinless. You know what that means? That in his humanity, he was like Adam and Eve before the fall. Yet without sin. See, we're fallen humanity. We're broken humanity. We're damaged. Bill Cosby said we're brain damaged people. Jesus is not damaged by humanity at all. He is perfect God. And simultaneously, he's perfect human all at once. Now, I'm going to put up some phrases and we're going to look them up in the Bible. And I'm going to ask the people to read. So if anybody's good at looking stuff up, I may ask you to read something for us. Jesus is eternally God. Anybody believe that? Yes. Anybody, anybody believe that? Yes. Now, let me just tell you that Jesus is not one of the eternal gods. Jesus is the only eternal God. Jesus is going to say there is no other way to get to the heavenly Father except through me. And we find that in John chapter 14. Now somebody look up this verse for me. John chapter 14, verse number 9. The disciples are with him and he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house there is what? Amen. There is room for everyone. There is enough room for everyone. If the whole world would get saved, everybody would have plenty of room. I love everybody. There's room enough for everyone. And if I go to the Heavenly Father and prepare a place just for you, you know what that means? That, that means... That there's a place, just not, um, you know, somebody said, I just want to live in Brenda's basement. No, you don't. You want to live in a place prepared just for you. Now, my place is filled with guitars. My place is filled with guitars and old black and white movies. My place is filled with guitars and old black and white movies and golf clubs. I play golf in heaven. I'm going to turn in 18 every time. Which hole? Play 18 holes, get 18 holes in one, call it a day. <laughs> God saying, I, I purposely make heaven with everybody in mind. In heaven, I will not be hair follically challenged. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> That's, I mean, we're talking prophecy here. Right? The, the, the sheep bears will come down and get you guys. And so, John chapter 14, Jesus said, there's no other way to get to heaven but through me. And, and then they just say this, show us the Father. You know, show us the Father. It's almost dripping with, with theological sarcasm. And what is the answer? Who's got verse number nine where they can read it? Bob. Read it, Phil. It says, Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Stop right there. What did Jesus say? Whoever has seen me has They say, seen show us the Father, and Jesus says, you're looking at him. You're looking at him. Isn't that what he's saying? You're looking at him. Jesus is eternally God. Now, I'm going to use this in the past tense. Jesus was because the physical life of Jesus died on the cross. Is that correct? correct. Although Jesus is still the second person, he is still total humanity, the work of Jesus Christ is complete. Complete. It's not over. It's complete. You know what it means? Jesus does not need to do one more thing for us to inherit eternal life. Everything that needed to have been done has been done. Did he live a perfect life? Yes. Did he die a sinless sacrifice? Yes. Did he die for sinful people? Yes. Did he go to the tomb? Yes. Did he rise over victorious over life? Yes. Is he sitting at the right hand of the Father? Yes. His work is complete. Hear me. There's a difference between done and complete. I'm done working on the shed in my backyard. Oh, just stop working there. Oh, <laughs> right, you got that one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's, he was totally human. In Isaiah 7, 14, write these down. In Isaiah 7, 14, King Ahaz is about ready to go into a bad agreement with the king of Russia. Sound all too real? He's about ready to go into a bad agreement with the king of Assyria. And, and, and Isaiah goes away and says, just wait. In two years, this will all be over. By the time a girl has a baby, two years from now, this will all be over. Don't do this deal. Trust God. How many of us will say, I'd rather get into a bad deal today than to wait for God down the line? 
Anybody ever do that? I've done that. I've done that. I thought, well, you know, let's do this and ask God to bless it later. Doesn't work, does it? No. Okay. And so he, uh, Isaiah goes to him and he says, a virgin shall be with child. A virgin shall be with child. Now let me just say that this word for virgin in Hebrew literally means a woman who is about ready to give her birth to her first baby. It does not necessarily mean that a woman is going to give birth to a child without having ever been with a man. So he's saying that, hear me, this is going to happen. And most people believe that the wife that he's talking about is his own. But is there a bigger picture? Because what good would it have done for me to go to George and say, George, don't worry. The answer is going to come. It's just going to take 600 years. And George would go, okay. <laughs> You see, Ahaz needed an answer right now. And so he said, don't worry, in two years, before two years is up, this will all be over. This will be done. But he had another, God had another picture in mind. So if we go to Matthew chapter 123. In Matthew chapter 123, we have Joseph about ready to put Mary out. Because Mary here goes to visit her cousin or her aunt. Hard to tell the difference in the Greek language there but her relative, who had been barren, who is now a child. And she goes to visit her, and when she comes back, she's pregnant. And how many of us guys would go, uh, how'd that happen? I wonder if God supernaturally put his son in her. Or how many of us would have said, I know what she's been doing. Come on, let's just be honest. When, when Joseph looked at Mary, what was the natural thought for him to have? And so, because he was such a good man, he says, I don't want her stoned to death. Because what happens to women who get pregnant out of wedlock back in the day of Jesus? They got stoned to death. He said, I don't want her to get stoned to death, but I don't want to stay married to a woman who's been unfaithful already. But let's remember, why did Mary even go to Elizabeth in the first place? Because Elizabeth had been childless. Now, what was the thought in the minds of the people back then to women who were childless? They were so evil that God had made them barren so that the Messiah could not come through them. Think about that for a minute. They, it was God's intention to say, I won't let you have children because you're so evil. Now I want you to think about this. She's married to a guy whose job is a priest. Is that right? So here's the priest and everybody's going, well, the priest is married to somebody who's so evil, can't even have kids. Can you imagine what their reputation, the dichotomy of feelings that people would have about this family and their community? And now all of a sudden, Mary finds out that Elizabeth is what? She's no longer barren, which means she's no longer what? She's no longer seen as evil. If all of a sudden if somebody had that kind of freedom experience, would you not want to go say, yes, my family has been vindicated. We've been freed up. We're no longer on the tyranny of bad thoughts. Yes, it's at the party. When she comes back, she is expecting, and is about ready to throw her out of his lineage. And in verse number 23, what does it say? It says, Behold the virgin. A virgin. Now, it's, it's the retelling of Isaiah 7.14. That's why we know that it was important for Isaiah to hear it at that time. Ahaz to hear it through Isaiah at that time. But it had a bigger meaning than just then. Did you know that every time something significantly happens to you, God has a bigger meaning for all of your future children, grandchildren, and beyond? How do I know that? Do you think something that you do right or wrong today could affect your family forever? Oh, no. How many of us were I don't think so. Did Adam and Eve's sin affect humanity forever? Yeah. Yes. Did it? Yes. So do you think you could possibly do something in your life that could affect your generations and the entire world forever. Yeah. Yeah. And so, again, Jesus is so, is so that a virgin shall be with child. Now, if we go to Luke, we find out in Luke 127 and, and 34 that from Mary's point of view, she is meeting with the angel Gabriel. And the angel Gabriel shows up and says this, that you will have a child. Now, the phrase here for the virgin in Luke, literally Luke is a doctor, a medical doctor. Is that correct? And Luke does not just use the phrase, a virgin. He says, the person who you are are going to have a baby without any of the DNA or fluids that comes from the male of the species. 
Think about that just for a second. It is not that we're just going to do artificial insemination. It's not that we're just going to do DNA cross-representation. It's going to be that there is no human male component in this at all. And she goes, I don't get it. Isn't that what she says? How can this be? Now, some of us would still say, I still don't get it. You know what? I like that. See, if I had a God that I completely understand, my God would be too small. I need a God that's bigger and better and beyond comprehension who still loves me and is intimately cared for me. I, I will never understand God. And that's good because that means God is so big, he's bigger than my every thought. But I know this, I understand that he loves me all the time. And he will never leave me or forsake me. And so she says, how can this be since I have never known a man? And what did he say? With God, all things are possible. Now let's go to Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians chapter 4, verse number 4. Did you know that the book of Galatians was written before Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Did you know the writing of the, of the book to Galatia is the first book of the New Testament written in chronological history? So before there was Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we already had theology. So before we had history, we had theology. Before we had narrative, we had uh, narration. And so in Galatians 4.4, 4, it says, at just the right time. At just the right time. And now what was the key thought in Luke 18.8? 8? It says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? You know what that means? That there is no such thing as out of sequence with God. At just the right time. In other words, God's DNA is imprinted on the chronos, the chronology, the timetable of humanity. From Genesis to Revelation, from the garden to the consummation of the ages, God's DNA, and God is in control of time. He doesn't keep time on a Rolex. God keeps time on his heart. And so what time is it in God's world? It's God's time. What time should it be in our world? And so he says, at just the right time. Now, Jesus is eternally God. Jesus was totally human. Jesus is knowing what he's doing. Have you ever followed someone who didn't know where they were going or what they were doing, but they just said, follow me? And you go, uh, all right. <laughs> now, how many, you, anybody ever hear that phrase, the blind leading the blind? Now, how many of us will get in line behind a blind person and say, and follow the leader? I want to get behind someone who's already been there, done that, and hear me, and conquered. It's one thing to been there, done that, and failed it. Been there, done that, and failed it. Been there, done that, and failed it. Um, when I first tried out for the Washington Senators, uh, I was in the batting cage, and they were throwing batting practice, and I was batting, and when I was batting, I thought I was doing a great job. I mean, I was hitting everything they threw, and I, you know, I was just... Five, six, seven hundred inches, you know what I mean? Uh, they were really flying out almost out of the infield. You know, I mean, I was just tattooing every ball. And there was a guy in the background going, His shoulders low. His elbow's too high. He's got his feet pointing in the wrong direction. And I'm hitting every pitch they're throwing. And I turn around and it's Ted Williams. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever heard of Ted Williams? Mm -hmm. He was the manager of the team. The last person who ever hit 400 in the major leagues. And he was, if I would have made the team, which I didn't, but uh, that would have been my manager. And here I am thinking I'm doing everything right. And the first thing I thought of is, he knows what he's talking about. Even though I may think I'm doing everything right, according to the best of the best, I'm doing everything wrong. Who do you want your batting coach to be? Do you want it to be you or do you want it to be Ted Williams? Who do you want your life coach to be? Jesus Christ. Who is God. Well, let's start putting it all together. He is eternally God. He's totally human. He knows life from every human perspective, including how to die. Did he not die on the cross? Yes. Did he not cry out, Father, is there any other way for this to happen? May this come pass to me? Did he not have thrombrosis, capillarial explosion? Did he not have to suffer the, the nails being driven through his wrists and his feet? Did he not have him come up and, and stick a spirit aside to authenticate that he had a third spacing and blow out all the water? I mean, he authenticated everything humanity has to authenticate, and at the same time, he's coming again. 
He is not just the Jesus of history. He is the Jesus of all life. Yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Uh, you see, they knew about the Messiah that they wanted. But they got the Messiah God gave them. And yet he did not find them looking for him. They were saying, show us the Father. And when Jesus said, you're looking at him, they said, show us another Father. <laughs> can I get, can I get, can, can I get something different? And Jesus is saying, this is what you need. Take what I want. And so on that particular day, he says, when I come, are you going to be faithful? Are you going to be faithful? Now, he said it to the people then, but he's been saying it to every generation of people since, right? When the Son of Man comes, could it be today? Yes. Will he find faith on the earth? Yes. I hear the only answer I can say yes is he'll find faith in me. Joshua, at the end of his life, called all the people together. And he said, y'all can do whatever you want to do with your lives. But you remember what he said? As for me and my house, we will, we will, he will find faith. Now, who's ready now to study the two parables? Are you ready? All right, you know what the next slide is going to say? <laughs> but in order for us to understand what he said about the parable, we need to understand what he said about himself. Now we got the foundation. So that means I'll see you Sunday. <laughs> but before you leave today, let's pray. Dear Heavenly God Father, who is Jesus Christ and His eternal Holy Spirit, all in one glory that blows my mind, and yet it seals up my confidence. So Lord, help me to not try to dissect and over-evaluate who you are. Help me dissect me compared to who you are. And may faith be found in me. May I have the faith of knowing you are eternally God. Knowing you know how I feel on my worst day, on my best day, every day. You know me, you care about me, and you have a plan to give me victory in my life. And Father, not only do you have a plan to give me victory today, but it says justice will come speedily, nevertheless. So Lord, help me to quit putting my, my faith in a contract of a time continuum. I'd say in six months this will be better. Help me to say, it, in six months it might be the exact same, but with Jesus Christ, I can do all things. I can endure all things. I will be conquering over all things. This world will never get me down again. Because my faith is not in this world. My faith is not of this world. My faith is in eternal God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, whatever it is that's bearing us down today, help us to be lifted up in Christ. Whatever it is that's preventing us from the freedom that, that Elizabeth needed, she didn't need a baby boy. She needed to know that God loved her. And she saw that through the baby boy, John the Baptist. Lord, we have needs we are crying out in desperation. We are beyond hope. We are damaged through the, the penalty of the sin. And yet in the midst of all of that, it would be easy to give up. Father, help us to not give up. Help us to give in to Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, as we humbly submit to you, not only today, but every second of every day, Help us to find solace in the world. That you know us, you love us, you have a plan for us, and at just the right time, the timetable continuum of Jesus Christ, you will restore us, even us. What a blessed hope. What a blessed God. What a blessed Savior. Help us to live less filled lives and then be a source of blessing for those who love us. So Lord, thank you for this wonderful title that you love to tell about yourself and help us to love to tell others the wonderful title. And we pray this in the name of the Father, in the blood of the Son, in the empty tomb of the Savior, and through the end of
dwelling presence. 